Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today we are going to start our discussion into the large topic of Fourier analysis. This is exciting because we're going to see that Fourier analysis comes into a lot of different science and engineering problems. You'll see them prop up in things like signal processing, uh, control theory, partial differential equations, and a lot more. So today to get started, let's start with the basics and talk about the Fourier series. So we're going to see that eventually the Fourier series is really nothing more than just adding up a whole bunch of science and cosines at different amplitudes and different frequencies, and that's going to have a lot of implications down the road. So to get started with this, let's refresh our memory on the idea of periodic functions, right? So the mathematical definition of a periodic function is this, right? It's that if you have a function and you look at it at some point, and then you look at it at that point plus the period, you get the same value, right, for every value of x. So the picture that goes along with this is something like this. So a periodic function is basically a function that repeats with a periodicity or a period of p, right? So you can see that every p seconds, if that's what the x-axis represents, the function has the exact same value. And again, it doesn't have to just be, you know, a lot of times people draw them, um, the period being between these kind of distinct points here, but really the period can be between any two points, right, if you want to consider it, all it's saying is that the function has the exact same value at a value here and then the value plus the period, right? So again, really simple idea. Um, now, where it gets interesting is if that is true, you can start thinking about uh, interesting properties of periodic functions. Namely, let's consider if you have two functions. Maybe f looks like this blue one and g looks like something completely different. You have two different functions, they're both periodic, and they both have the same period of p, okay? Then if that's true, then first, let's just consider f by itself. I think you'll agree that this is, a, this is true, right? We said earlier, if this was uh, not here, if n was equal to 1, that's the de definition of a periodic function, right? And again, this is a little bit of a duh, you know, this is nothing earth shattering. It's just saying that, okay, at a function here is the same thing as a function one period in front, or two periods, right? n could be equals to two, or n could be three, or n could be basically any integer, right? And it just repeats and repeats and repeats, right? So this first property is, is nothing major. This next property is kind of interesting, though, is if we consider these two periodic functions, f and g, together, we can actually scale f by some value, scale b, uh, g by some other constant. You add the two together and you end up with a third function, a composite function, which is actually also periodic with period p. So as a quick example, here's a couple, uh, I'll show a screenshot of something that I just kind of hacked together. Um, so the first function is just this uh, cosine wave, right, which is actually phase shifted and maybe has an amplitude of two. Right, that's the blue line there, let's call that f. And then g might be some other periodic function, as long as it has the same period. I think in this case, I'm using a period of four seconds in both of these cases. So this green signal is a triangle wave, and now if I just scale those two together by some arbitrary amount, I think I multiplied this cosine wave by negative three, I multiplied by the triangle wave by eight, I added them together, and you get this red thing on the bottom, right? You can see it's, it's clearly a composition of those two, and it's weird looking, but again, the interesting feature is that it is also periodic with period of four, right? So again, that's kind of interesting. That shows this bottom property is true, and we're gonna lean on this a little bit later, okay? Okay, so with that idea of periodic functions down, let's go ahead and start talking about uh, trigonometric series, okay? So a trigonometric series, it's really just an infinite series of this form, right? It's basically, if you read this thing long enough and you expand this, um, this sum, it's just a bunch of cosine and sine waves put together, right, with potentially some uh, constant offset, okay? So that's the idea with a uh, trigonometric series, right? And now a Fourier series is nothing more than a trigonometric series where we pick these a0, an, bn, we pick those coefficients in a very specific fashion, okay? So that's all a Fourier series is. It's again just a bunch of sine and cosines where these numbers um, are, are chosen in a specific way, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and ask ourselves, all right, well, then how do you choose these coefficients, right? How do we compute these, okay? So let's go ahead and consider, you've got yourself a function f of x. It could be something crazy. Think about that, that weirdo red signal we looked at earlier where it was periodic, but 
I, I don't know necessarily maybe how to describe it, but it's periodic, right? Okay, let's go ahead and for now, let's consider functions that have a period of 2 pi. This is just going to make the math easier and down the road we're going to see that the period doesn't matter. We can scale all our results by simply just scaling the x-axis or the independent variable. But for now to make this easy, just consider a period of 2 pi. Okay, so what we're interested in doing here with the Fourier series is I want to find all these ai and bi coefficients such that I can make this function reproduced by basically adding up all of these cosine and sine waves, right? So I can make this trigonometric series, this Fourier series here uh, of sines and cosines equal to the function f of x, right? So that's my goal. And maybe a quick little asterisk that maybe I should mention is sometimes in some texts you might not see an equal sign, you might see like a, a, a kind of an approximate sign. Maybe let me do this in another color just so you can kind of Maybe something like this, because there are situations where you cannot make the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. This, this infinite series might not converge, or it might converge to something which is actually not the function you're interested in, but that's a pretty rare occurrence in a lot of practical science and engineering problems. So for a lot of times, um, you'll actually see just a normal equal sign, right? That's our goal, is I want to make the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. I'm going to hope that I can find these coefficients that make that true and we should be good to go. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and ask ourselves again, all we're looking for is this a0, a1234 up to infinity, and b1234 up to infinity, right? I'm just looking for those coefficients, okay? Okie dokie, so uh, let's go ahead and start with this a0, okay? How are we gonna find this a0? So one thing we can do is, okay, we know this function is periodic with period of two pi. Let's just integrate this function f maybe by, uh, between negative pi and pi. So we're gonna integrate it over one period. And again, it doesn't matter if I integrate it, you know, from here to here or from here to here. I'm just gonna pick, as long as I'm integrating over the entire period, we should be okay, right? So this is going from minus pi to pi, which is clearly, clearly a period of two pi. So I'm gonna integrate over the whole thing. Let's ask ourselves, what happens if I put an integral sign in front of here? Well, I gotta put an integral sign on the other side as well. So that's all I've done here, okay? So let's just integrate both sides between minus pi to pi, okay? Let's start breaking up this uh, right-hand side, okay? So let's just integrate this constant here by itself is probably pretty easy. I'm gonna integrate that. And then I'm gonna integrate the, in, the infinite series part. This is where we might have a little bit more trouble, okay? So that's what I'm doing here. This first integral, which is just integrating the constant, that's pretty easy, it just turns into two pi a zero, right? And now let's write out a couple of these terms, right? I'm not gonna write it all the way up to infinity, obviously, but I think if you if I write out just two or three terms, I think you're gonna see what's going on. So let's go just n equals one, right? So here's the n equals one term. Let me maybe just put this here in blue, right? Here's the n equals one term, right? So this is n equals one. And maybe let's pick another color, maybe red down here. Here's the n equals two term, right? So everyone see what's going right, and then plus dot dot dot, you gotta do this all the way to infinity, right? But again, I think you're gonna see what's going on. Let's look at this n equals one term. In fact, maybe let's, let's, let's look even closer. Let's look at this first integral. It's the cosine thing, right? This thing right here. What is that asking? It says integrate this thing a cosine x between minus pi and pi, right? That's actually not bad, right? Because I think everyone knows what cosine looks like Right, uh, gosh, I'm gonna embarrass myself. Uh, it goes like, I think it's like this, right? So here's pi, here's minus pi. Doesn't it look like this, right? Starts out at one, goes down to negative one, right? What I'm getting at here though, is if you integrate between minus pi and pi, right? What are we talking about? We got, we got negative area here, right? And then you got positive area up here. Oh, maybe I'll cross hatches in the other direction. Does everyone agree that the negative area and the positive area cancel each other out, right? So this whole thing in dashed, this is a big fat zero, right? Same thing with this, sine. Sine is just cosine shifted by, uh, by, by 90 degrees, right? So by the same logic, you could do this and you can get yourself, hey, this thing is zero, right? Okay, let's look down here on these terms, okay? So same thing, maybe I'll just circle, let's just focus on this one integral right here, right? Okay, all this is is this cosine wave, but the angular frequency is doubled, right? So now it's, it's basically, it's jamming in two of these waves, 
but the same amount of positive and negative area occur, right? So again, this thing is also zero. This is zero. In fact, everything over here is zero, right? The only term that's non-zero is this term right here, okay? So what we end up with is basically this integral is equal to 2 pi a0, right? So maybe let me, let me, let me erase this and write that down. So we end up with this side is unchanged, right? It's integral minus pi to pi f of x dx is equal to 2 pi a0. I'm trying to solve for a0, so just move this 2 pi to the other side, right? Uh, sorry, let me get this out of the way here, right? Move this to the other side, 1 over 2 pi, there you go, okay? So we got ourselves an expression for a0. So in order to compute a0, all you have to do is integrate that function between uh, minus pi and pi, and then scale it by 1 over 2 pi, right? So that's all we need to do to get a0. All right, so I've moved our overall Fourier slash trig uh, series up here to the top. Let's call this equation one, right? Remember the idea is the goal is we're trying to find these coefficients to make this trig series equal the function in question. We already found how to get a zero. So now let's focus on getting a n, okay? So the way we're gonna get that is let's multiply both sides of this equation here by this quantity cosine of mx, okay? Where m is another positive integer, okay? So all we're gonna do is multiply both sides by this cosine, okay? So what we end up with is left side, that's pretty easy, just multiply this by cosine. The right side, we're gonna multiply this entire trigonometric series by cosine of mx, so here you are, right? And again, let's do the exact same trick we did last time. Let's just integrate both sides between minus pi and pi, so again, you just basically, you, we get this, right? I'm gonna integrate the left side, I'm gonna integrate the right side, so I, I, I don't wanna rewrite this whole thing, so I just, you know, take this whole thing, shove it in here as the integrand, and integrate from minus pi to pi, okay? All right, so now, let's go ahead and again, break this thing up a little bit. So, I put a little dot, dot, dot here because I don't want to show all the steps. This is just boring kind of algebra at this point. Um, I've got the full details in the notes if you're interested, but I think you can see what's going on. I'm just gonna integrate this term, you know, I'm gonna distribute this cosine through, then I'm gonna integrate the first term. That's what this is right here. Then I'm gonna, uh, again, distribute the cosine and, and integrate this infinite series portion, which is this whole gobbledygook over here, right? Okay, couple of things we can notice. Again, this is looks like a very familiar thing we talked about earlier, right? You're just integrating a cosine wave between minus pi and pi, so I don't care what m is, as long as it's a positive integer, right? This whole thing has equal area above and below zero, so this whole thing is zero, right? So that guy's gone, so we're just left with this, this infinite series portion, okay? So, one thing we're gonna do now is, notice here there's an integral of cosine nx, cosine mx, right? And sine nx, cosine mx, right? So we're gonna use ourselves, you remember this trig identity where you have cosine of x times cosine of y is equal to one half times cosine of x plus y plus cosine of x minus y. And similarly for uh, a mixed pair where you have sine and cosine, you can rewrite it like this. So all we're gonna do is let's apply this trig identity to basically, you know, this portion here right? That's going to apply this guy. And then the blue portion here, we're going to just apply that, the blue trig identity there, okay? So if you do that, you end up with this. Let's just rewrite the integral portion, okay? So let's just write, in fact, maybe I should extend my little, um, my, my, instead of maybe using this brace, let me, let me go ahead and use a, a bracket, right? This guy, okay? So I'm going to rewrite that right here, right? Here's the bracketed portion. Okay, so you end up with this, okay? It's again, just plugging in this trig identity and then distributing the integrals through. And then same thing, let's apply that trig identity to this entire integral. Again, so not counting the, the coefficient, right? So it's like this, okay? That is this portion here. Apply the trig identity, you end up with this, okay? So if you stare at this thing long enough, you end up with, there's, there's, there's one, two, three, four of these integrals, right? So here's, Here's one integral, two integrals. I mean, I'll keep the blues. And eh, now it's, eh, sure, fine. Three, four, okay? So what's fascinating about this is, um, again, uh, keep in mind, n and m are all positive integers, okay? 
So this here actually is the same boat we were in over here, right? You're integrating a cosine wave, okay? So this whole thing is zero, right? The integral number one is zero. Integral number two is actually not zero for all cases of n and m, right? If n and m are dissimilar, then this is zero. But what's interesting is the case where n and m are equal, what do you end up with here? You get cosine of zero, which is actually one, right? And then you integrate from minus pi to pi, so this integral is two pi, right? And then you take a one half of this, so this, is, this whole thing evaluates to pi. So this guy here is actually equal to pi if n equals m, and then it's zero otherwise. So fascinating. This one integral number two actually has a very, it has a value of pi in this one specific case. Now, let's turn our attention to these other, these blue ones here. This one, um, similar case, this is actually zero. Okay, and this, you actually get, uh, look at this, sine of when n is equal to m, that's actually sine of zero. So this actually turns, this is still zero. So this is also zero, right? And again, if you don't believe me about this here, I'm gonna do this in Mathematica over here on the side of the screen. You can see this, this is what ends up happening, right? Zero, zero, zero. This is the only term that is non-zero and it's only non-zero in the special case when n is equal to m. Now, if you look at this thing long enough, that means that the coefficient here of a m, right? That's the only one that's gonna be non-zero because I don't even care what any of these other coefficients are because they're gonna be multiplied by, by, by all zeros. So the only time it's non-zero is the coefficient a m, Mike, right? So this whole thing, right? The, le the, the left side was this, right? So here we go, left side right, here's the thing, is equal to the right side, which was all these integrals, all these integrals, all these integrals, and, and there was only one term that was non-zero. It's this guy, am times pi, right? That's all we end up with here, right? So again, we're trying to solve for am, so I'm just gonna do that right here. I'll just, I'll just move, divide both sides by pi, move pi to the other side. Bam, here we are, and in fact, what I can do is, Remember, m, m is just one, two, three, four. It's just some integer. You know, why don't I just rename this? And I'm gonna instead of calling it m or m for Mike, let's use n for November, right? So a n these coefficients. I just gotta change everywhere I see an uh, m, change it to an n, right? Here you go. So this right here is how we are gonna get a n, right? So this is fascinating to get these coefficients a n. Here, all you gotta do, take the function you're interested in, multiply it by cosine of nx, and integrate from minus pi to pi, and scale it by one over pi, right? So, fascinating. And what's actually even more fun, and in the interest of time, I don't think I'm gonna go through it. Um, I think you saw how this works. You can do the exact same thing to get, if we wanted to find bn, right? All you're gonna do is multiply this now, by, instead of cosine of mx, you're gonna multiply by sine of mx, right? And you go through this entire process, entire process, yada, 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 make all the same arguments, and you'll come up with an expression for bn to basically look very, very similar. It's gonna be one over pi integral from minus pi to pi of sine of nx times f of x dx. Right, and n is equal to one, two, yada, yada, yada. So here we are. All right, so now we've got all of the coefficients and we've got everything we need to fully define our Fourier series. So I erased some of the uh, markings on the board and I moved all of these coefficients to one location. So again, this is the pure definition, right? This is how we are gonna compute our Fourier series to get this trigonometric series to equal the function that we're interested in, right? Here's how to get a zero, and then here's all these a and b n coefficients, right? So everything in one place. Now, uh, the last thing I think we want to talk about is, uh, you know, kind of the elephant in the room, right? The fact that this series goes up to infinity, right? This is actually not practically uh, reasonable. Mathematically, it might be nice, but 
boy, um, I don't want to have to take this uh, all the way up to n equals to infinity because I'm going to spend a lot of time writing things up on the board. So a lot of times it's going to be useful to look at what's called partial sums. So all the partial sum is, is basically uh, we're going to stop and not go all the way up to infinity. So instead, let's go ahead and define maybe the partial sum. Let's call it Sn of f of x to basically be, instead of going up to n equals infinity, let's stop at some upper limit capital N, right? And a lot of times you may see this notation of just, let's just call this Sn of x or just Sn, right? However you want to think about it, these all mean the same thing. Um, it's just a partial sum, but we are still going to compute these coefficients uh, in the same manner, okay? So, uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at an example now. All right, so let's look at an example of a very simple square wave. So one period of the square wave can be described like this, right? It's, re it's a really simple function, right? If it's between minus pi and zero, it has a value of negative k. If it's between the value of zero and positive pi, it has a value of positive k. So again, just drawing one cycle of this period, it looks like this, right? It's pretty darn simple. It's this kind of stepping square wave. And again, the thing that we probably got to remember is that we're only defining one cycle here or drawing one cycle of this, but it's a periodic function. So this thing is going to just continue on both sides, you know, kind of forever, right? So it's just a square up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's got these discontinuous jumps every once in a while, which actually is going to make this problem a little bit interesting, but that's, uh, that's getting ahead of ourselves. So let's just go ahead and say, hey, this is the red function, right? I want to go ahead and find the Fourier series that uh, approximates this red function, okay? So again, let's just go ahead and compute the coefficients of our Fourier series. So a0, it's, uh, it's pretty simple, just read it off. And again, I think from inspection, you can basically see uh, this is just integrating the function between minus pi and positive pi, right? So there's the same amount of negative area as there is positive area. So this is just going to be a big fat zero, right? Okay, great. Let's now go for a n. A n, we just got to do this operation, okay? So here's the equation. Now to make this a little bit easier because this is sort of this piecewise function, um, I'm going to break up this integral into two integrals. So let's just integrate from minus pi to zero. And the reason we're going to do that is because in this domain, right, the function f of x, it's just negative k, right? It's just this constant value, right? So here's this range. Then I got to integrate from zero to pi. And in that domain, right, f of x is just equal to positive k. Great, so here you go. This makes it a lot easier. You can now run over and you can do this integral if you'd like. And interestingly, I'm just gonna break dot, dot, dot. You go ahead and you do this. You're gonna find out that, again, this whole thing turns into a whole lot of zeros for every possible value of n. So a n's are all zeros as well. Okay, interesting. Let's look at the b n's. So the b n's are hopefully something different. So we're gonna play the exact same trick, right? Let's compute the b n's by breaking up this integral between negative pi to zero and then from zero to pi which allow us to stick in the function values at that location and if you do this and you go dot 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 you go ahead and you do these integrals you come up with this expression here okay and what's interesting is if you stare at this thing long enough right look at this you get this thing this cosine of n pi and this thing right if you look at it what does cosine of n pi look like right so cosine of n pi, right? This thing is, it's what? It's positive one if n is odd, or no, excuse me, uh, even. Yeah, no, even, right? If n is even, right? Because if it's zero, two pi, three pi, uh, you know, or, you get it, right? A any positive, uh, yeah, yeah, I keep, why am I having a little bit of a, uh, Right, if you're here, zero or, uh, no, no, zero or two pi, right? You get back here to positive one. Four pi, you come back to positive one, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is positive one if it's even, and it's actually negative one if n is odd, right? Okay, great. So that's what this thing looks like, right? Now, what's interesting is you get the one minus this. So in any case where n is even, right, this whole thing goes to zero, right? So this expression here is zero if n is even, right? So the only time this thing is non-zero is if n is odd, right? 
So this whole BN coefficient, it looks like this, right? You do the math, you get it's 4k over n pi if n is odd, and otherwise it's zeros, right? So this is actually pretty darn interesting, right? So this partial sum, we can start looking at it, and we see that it, uh, let's make ourselves a little table, right? So for when n is one, there's only one term in my partial uh, sum, right? And it's just 4k over pi times sine of x, right? If n is two, we don't get any extra terms, right? Because everything is zero in this case for, for even n's. So this is the same for one, n equals one or two, right? You get this expression. Now, when you jump up to n equals three, we add one term in the expansion. So this term is the same, right? But now we're gonna add one more term in this uh, summation. So here's the extra term, right? It's now it's 4k over three pi times sine of three x. So we add another sine wave of a higher frequency, right? But it's still periodic in this, in this period from minus pi to pi, right? Okay, and same thing. This is the same for if you have n equals three or four, and now you jump up to the next even one, and all we're doing now is adding a fifth term, like a higher, high, a higher harmonic, right? Where you now have a sine wave of frequency five, right? So this is interesting, right? You can start seeing how you start building up these terms, um, and it just jumps up for every odd expression, right? Every odd n, you get an extra term in this. So. What we should do though is let's visualize, let's go to Mathematica and actually let's, let's look at how do these things change uh, and how do they look when you overplot them with the original function. All right, so here we are in Mathematica. Again, I've just got myself a little function to uh, compute the partial sums. And here's the table, uh, an expanded version of the table of what we just saw on the board. So let's plot each one of these for a uh, for a given value of k. So in this case, I think I picked a k of 2.3. It was just some, some number, right, to give the square wave an actual physical um, constant. So you can see the red square wave is back here, right? And right here, this is the first, the S1 term. This is just having one single sine wave trying to approximate this square wave. And you can see it, it it's reasonable, <laughs> I guess. It's not awesome, but it uh, this is what it does, right? Now, as we start increasing the number of terms in their partial sum, let's go up to maybe three. Okay, so three, now you've got the carrier sine wave underneath, but then you also have a higher frequency harmonic on top of it, and you can see that this is starting to get a little bit better, right? The green is starting to look a little bit more like the red, and if we just keep increasing the number of terms, let's go up to f uh, five and six, right? This looks better, let's go up one more. Here's the seven. Let's keep going up to nine or 10, or I guess E here, let's, let's jump up all the way up to 11, right? Oops, sorry, I hit enter accidentally. Um, Right, you see, this is interesting, right? So it starts getting better and better as you increase the number of terms. Now, what's interesting is maybe, um, I'll draw your attention to the discontinuity right here at, at x equals zero. You see, we've got this jump, and actually what's ending up happening here is, uh, this is what's known as the Gibbs phenomena with Fourier series. When you have these discontinuous jumps, there are tendencies to have this ringing occur, and um, this gets into signal processing, and we'll talk about this later, but you can probably imagine that this, this, this delta, this step, has a lot of frequencies embedded in it, which is what's causing this. And long story short, even increasing the number of terms all the way up to 35, notice that we're not really able to get rid of that. Um, but just something that's interesting to point out. But in general, as you increase the number of terms in your partial sum, the Fourier series approximation or that partial sum approximation gets closer and closer to the actual function. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. Now, the only other thing that maybe I wanted to show here is we're just plotting this over one period, right? But the uh, solution that we obtained using this Fourier series is it's periodic on the range of minus pi to two pi, right? It, or minus pi to pi for this period of two pi. So let me just scroll down a little bit and I've got a picture to show. So the red is the one cycle of the square wave which we were integrating, right? But if we plot that partial sum over a larger range, you can see that it repeats and it repeats and it's periodic over this two pi period. So kind of interesting. And again, all we're plotting here is just the various different partial sums with different levels of fidelity. So uh, kind of interesting, right? 
All right, so now that we're getting comfortable with this Fourier series, let's talk about a couple of tweaks and minor variations on the theme that we can apply that's gonna make this a lot more applicable and useful in future applications. So the first thing I wanna look at here is, let's think about what do we wanna do if the period is not between negative pi to pi, but instead between some arbitrary value of minus L to L, right? So all we're talking about doing now is just rescaling the X axis, right? So instead of going and having a period of two pi, we're now having a period of 2L. So it's just going to take a couple of minor tweaks to some of these terms. So for example, we've got to scale this x axis here. So this now becomes, instead of cosine of nx, this becomes cosine of uh, n pi over Lx, right? And same thing here, we're just rescaling the x axis. So this is now n pi over Lx. There, okay? Right, that's that. So the, the cosine and the sine terms now just go between uh, minus L and L. They're periodic on that phrase. And now we just got to change some of these uh, coefficients now. So instead of being 1 over 2 pi, this is now 1 over 2 L. And similarly, the limits of integration go from minus L to L. And similarly, down here, this goes from minus L to L. And again, we also need to scale. This is not pi anymore. This is now L. And then lastly, I think this is the last one, minus L to L, and then scale from L. And then again, in these cosine and sine terms, we just need to rescale the X axis. So this is now not NX, but instead N pi over LX, right? Let me just make that look a little bit more like an N. There we go. And same thing with the sine term. This is now N pi over LX. So those are the only modifications. So now, yeah, this is a more generic version of the Fourier series between uh, L, minus L and L. So this is now has a period of 2L, right? Which is perfect. That's going to allow us to scale this to different problems um, in the future. And then a lot of times in some engineering problems, you might not like to see it between minus L and L. Sometimes people like to write it between zero and like a period P. Um, so you could obviously make the substitution if you want of p the period might be two times L. Okay. So if you do this, you're basically saying, I want a function which goes between zero and P. It's periodic on that sense, right? Sometimes this is helpful if you have like a, you know, like a metal bar which has an end at zero and the other end is at P and that's what you want to solve for. So this you can do by just making a substitution, right? You, you look at this and you see that this basically says that what L is P over two, right? So just go ahead and everywhere you see an L in this expression, just substitute P over two. And in fact, if you do that with these expressions, I think you'll come up with an alternate uh, formulation of the Fourier series. In fact, if you look at things like Wikipedia and other entries, they'll give it to you in this format, which is periodic uh, with period P uh, instead of what you see here. But you can easily translate between one or the other by just simply making this substitution that L is P over two, right? So let's stick with this formulation. Um, as we go forward, this is going to be a little bit more helpful. Um, okay, so that's this first thing about how to rescale the Fourier series to an arbitrary period of 2L. Now, let's talk about how you can make some simplifications if your function of interest is uh, what's called even or odd, right? So just to refresh your memory on what the deal is with even and odd functions, right? So a function is called even is if it has this property, g of minus x is equal to g of x. Basically what this means is that uh, the function is basically what, it's, it's symmetric about the y-axis, right? So something like cosine is, is symmetric about the y-axis, so cosine is even. Co uh, on a similar note, odd functions have this property, right? So this is sort of like a, uh, it's, it's, it's reflected all over both axes, both the x and the y axes, right? So this is what's referred to as an odd function. And again, something like sine would be odd. So again, here's a picture of cosine and sine, and you can kind of get the picture of get what's going on, right? It, uh, an even function you can see has that symmetry um, across the uh, vertical 
axis, right? And then the odd function has that symmetry, uh, but it's flipped in both the kind of, you flip it once over the x, uh, sorry, excuse me, you flip it once over the y axis, and then you flip it over the x axis, and then you get this odd function. So again, this is, uh, this is what you end up with, right? With even and odd functions. Now, what's interesting about even and odd functions, right, is if you look at these pictures over here, you think about integrating it between um, the periods of these even and odd functions, right? And you can see that um, odd functions, right, their integral over that period is zero, right? Because you have the same amount of area above as below the curve, right? You have the same amount of positive and negative areas. And then for even functions, it's kind of interesting, right? It's the integral of the, uh, of the period, right? You can almost take like half of that period, right? and then just double it, right? Because you see that it's sym symmetric over um, the y-axis, so you can double it. So anyway, what that's going to allow us to do, long story short, is if you go through that and you rederive all these a, n, b, n coefficients for an even or odd function, you'll get actually this result here. So for even functions from a period from minus l to l, so a period with 2l, what you can see is that the Fourier series uh, simplifies to what's sometimes referred to as a Fourier cosine series because all of these bn coefficients turn out to be zero. So what you end up with is you end up with a Fourier series that looks like this, right? There are no bn terms. All of those are zero. So you only have cosine terms in your, in your Fourier series. So hence its name of Fourier cosine series, right? Similarly, for an odd function, um, you kind of get the opposite effect. An odd function will turn into what's known as a Fourier sine series because all of the cosine terms are gone and you're left with only uh, sine terms. And in fact, if you look at this, this is what we had with our square wave example, right? Our square wave was an odd function. And if you remember, we did all the math and yeah, all those a n coefficients turned out to be zero. So we were only left with sine terms. Uh, in your Fourier series. So kind of interesting and this is actually going to be very useful for a lot of engineering applications in the future. So if you have an even or an odd function, the Fourier series actually simplifies quite a bit. So that leads to our third discussion and kind of trick that we want to talk about. This is the idea of half range expansion. <clears throat> excuse me, half range expansions, okay? So the idea, now that we have this concept of even and odd functions down, it's, it's, it's not that complicated, right? Let's say you've got a problem where you've got some function. This is the original function. It has a period of L, right? So maybe I should write this down. So this is the original function, right? With period, oops, period L, right? It's this blue line, okay? And again, you can think about this. Um, in fact, we're going to look at this uh, in a concrete example in the future when we discuss partial differential equations. But imagine this is like the deflection of a string or something like that between 0 and L, right? You've got a guitar string, which starts here at 0, goes to L meters or however long. And this is what the deflection looks like, right? And now what I want to do is I want to get a Fourier series description of this blue curve. Well, yeah, you can totally do that. You can do that right off the bat. You can do this right here, pretty much, um, okay? Uh, and you're fine, right? The only thing that you gotta worry about now is what you're doing, right, is if you do a Fourier series of this blue curve, you're basically doing this, right? You are gonna, gonna assume that it's, it is periodic with period L. You're gonna get this, 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 right? It's, it's gonna be repeated, right? That's what the Fourier series is gonna describe. It's gonna describe this repeated function that looks like that. Now, what's very, very likely gonna happen in this case, right, is that this Fourier series for all these red curves, right, the sine and cosines, you're gonna have both cosine and sine terms, right? Because clearly, this is not an even or an odd function, right? It doesn't satisfy this, so you're going to have to go on full Fourier series like this, right? Okay, now the trick we can play here is, let's do a pre-processing step. Let's go ahead and again, I'm going to redraw this picture. So this is the exact same thing. Let's say you got this function like this, right? And uh, I'll try to replicate this picture as much as possible, okay? So here we go. Now, what we could do is we could actually ask ourselves, all right, I really care about the function between 0 and, and L, but what happens if I just kind of artificially expand this 
to negative L, and I'm going to expand it. I'm going to mirror it so that I end up with this, right? So here is the original function here, right? Original function, right? And I'm going to artificially just kind of add or expand or extend. So I'll write that down, expand slash extend as an even function, right? Right? So now what I can do is I can consider getting a Fourier series between minus L and L, right? So this now is an expanded function with period 2L, right? And the benefit of this, right, is that this sucker, this is an even function. Hence, I would expect there to only be cosine terms in it. So if I go ahead and do the Fourier series so of this thing, right? So we go ahead and do the Fourier series, right? What we're really doing now is if I draw this picture to be kind of consistent, right? Is this is where it might get a little bit busy. So I'm going to apologize here, but I'm going to go ahead and we've got, you know, this guy, right? So here's one iteration. But we're going to assume that this thing repeats, but it repeats as an even function, right? So the nice thing about doing this is that if I expand this function using this even technique, what ends up happening is this red Fourier series over here, this only has cosine terms, right? So this is basically a Fourier cosine series down here. So that's awesome. That makes it so it's a much simpler uh, Fourier series. We can play the exact same trick, right? Is let's get look at our original function, right? It looks like this, right? And now we're going to do the same thing, but as you can probably imagine, now let's go and expand this thing as an odd function. So I got to do it like this, right? Okay. So again, this is now the expanded portion, but I'm going to do this as an odd function, right? So now when I go ahead and Fourier series this thing, right, what we're going to end up with is, uh, sorry, the board's getting a little bit busy, but I think you get the picture at this point, right? So this, this, and now this is going to repeat like this, right? It's going to, oh boy, it looks like that. And then that, and then you, you get the picture, right? But the, what's nice about this is if you expand this as an odd function, what you end up with is the Fourier series of this red over here is only going to have sine terms in it. So again, it's a pretty simple idea of what we can do is if you have some function you care about with period L, you can just artificially expand it in either direction using an even or an odd function representation. And therefore, you're going to get a much simpler Fourier series at the end of the day. So again, um, I just want to introduce this idea and this concept here. We will look at a concrete example of this later when we start looking at things like the wave equation or the heat equation or partial differential equations. This will come into play. Okay. Okay, um, and I guess while we're talking about things that might come into play, maybe what we should mention is that um, if you actually have coefficients of, if we're going to start adding f functions together, you can actually add uh, their coefficients uh, together as well. So tell you what, let me, uh, let me write this down actually. Maybe that's a good place to write this down. Just as a quick side note because it's similarly related to this. So we'll just basically say that, you know, the Fourier um, coefficients um, of the sum, let's say you got two functions, F1 plus F2, right? You're going to add these two together, right? So it's basically, this is the sum of the corresponding coefficients of both F1 and F2, right? So we're going to show the sum are the uh, sum of the corresponding coefficients for F1 and F2, right? And so basically, this is this is like superposition, right? It, it holds in this case. So that's also going to be very helpful when we start looking at PDEs. We're going to start building up solutions based on uh, building up larger solutions based on individual solutions. Okay, uh, great. 
All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is um, this idea of, you know, is the Fourier series coefficients, is that really the best way we can approximate a function using these uh, trigonometric cosine and sines, right? So again, let's just consider a partial sum of, you know, you know, any trigonometric series, right? Remember we talked earlier, it's a trigonometric series just looks like this, right? It's just sines and cosines. And the only thing that made the Fourier series special was we had a special way of computing these coefficients, a zero, a n, b n, all those things, right? Uh, so I'm sure the natural question that comes up with this, right, is first of all, is how accurate is this, this partial sum to the actual function f, right? How are we gonna measure quote unquote accuracy, right? And then if we're able to measure accuracy, the other question that might pop into your head, right, is is Fourier series the best way to do this, right? Or are there other potential coefficients, maybe like some alpha n and beta n, right? That might yield a better fit besides using the a n, b n's that we've been, that, that we have over here. Right? These were our Fourier coefficients. Maybe there's some other magic combination that would do better than these Fourier coefficients. Okay, so um, let's answer the first question. Right? How to how to measure accuracy? Right? A very classic way of measuring accuracy or fit between two functions is to use um, a least squared or an integrated least squares approach. Right? So the idea is you have some function f. Right. This is the true thing that you're trying to get to. And you're going to look at trying to approximate it with this partial sum SN. Right. So the way you could do that, again, the picture is just down here. Right. You've got the blue, which is the actual function. The red is some other approximate function. How do I measure the fit between the two of them? Right. Well, one easy way to do this is just look at the integrated error between the squared of these. Right. So you look at the error between any given location. Right. You square that so it's always positive, and then you integrate between uh, minus pi and pi or the domain, right? So what we see is this metric is sometimes referred to as the least squared or the squared error metric, right? Because there's an error here and you square it so that it's always positive, right? Okay, so if this is gonna be our established metric, right, of telling how close is Sn to the function f, What's interesting about this is in the notes, I've got a whole lot, you know, a few pages of dot, 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 showing how you can actually work out and prove that actually what's going on is that if you want to minimize this particular error metric, then the only way that happens is if you use the Fourier coefficients. So what's interesting is that the Fourier coefficients will minimize the squared error. Okay. So again, this dot, dot, dot is a couple of pages long. So again, feel free to check out the notes if you're interested, but let's just remember that the Fourier coefficients and this Fourier series, it is the best you can do if you're trying to use this as your error metric for, uh, for fitting it for success. So with that being said, um, I think this is probably a good spot to leave it. We are going to be extending this idea of Fourier series. We're going to talk about more complicated things like uh, Fourier transforms, discrete Fourier transforms, and further on down the road, we're going to see how this Fourier series can be used to synthesize solutions to complicated engineering problems like uh, partial differential equations, um, signal processing, forced oscillations, uh, Bode plots. It, it opens up a whole world because a lot of engineering problems can be broken down into sine and cosines. And this is actually a, formulatic, uh, a formulaic way to go about doing that for an arbitrary function. So um, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. Clicking on the subscribe button really does help me continue making these videos. And the new videos come out every Monday. So I hope I'll be able to catch you at a future discussion and we can all learn something new together. So until then, I think I'm going to sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.